Welcome back to Investing Wizards. It's my pleasure to have Benit Katari on with me today. Benit is the founder of Techni Capital, uh, also the portfolio manager at Techni Capital. Uh, thanks for being on and would love an a, uh, intro on uh, Techni and your investment style to begin with. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Rob. Uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, Techni is a investment fund based in New York. We manage about a billion dollars and we focus exclusively on technology companies globally and our investment style would probably be simplistically and, and accurately described as very concentrated, very long term and focused on avoiding, uh, you know, probability of permanent capital loss uh, measured over three, four, five years. So, um, so uh, so that means you kind of weigh the odds of, of upside versus downside very heavily. Um, no, I, I, I think for us, avoiding permanent capital loss has evolved to mean something very specific, which is our, our preference is to invest in companies that are growing, that are profitable and unlevered. And, you know, this comes out of a series of, uh, lessons that I guess I've learned or we've learned as a team over 15, 16 years of doing this, uh, we, we, we have found, for example, if a company doesn't have debt, you can't go bankrupt. Uh, if a company is able to grow and, and generate profits on that growth without the use of debt, the odds that as an equity owner, you're going to take a permanent capital loss on that over some period of time is, is, is substantially different and lower than if not. So our, our starting point for, for you know, is, is this a good investment or not, is not the risk reward ratio per se, but it's more about uh, is, is, you know, what are the chances that your equity gets permanently impaired over three, four, five years? Got and and uh, just to uh, kind of clarify that point, a company can go bankrupt without debt, but less likely. Correct. That's correct. <laughs> Uh, aha. Um, okay. And then, um, what, so uh, Techni is a TMT fund, um, invests around the globe looking at stocks. There's, there's a lot of TMT funds out there. Um, how would you define your style um, and what you bring to the table that's unique uh, versus uh, maybe some of the other larger uh, TMT funds out there? Well, uh, if we compare ourselves to some of the larger funds, well, then it um, the, the, the difference is, is, is straightforward, which is that, you know, we're able to invest in smaller companies. Uh, we uh, are able to, uh, I think, you know, building a portfolio of 10 companies, which is roughly what we own today, is, in my opinion, significantly more difficult than building a portfolio of 30 or 40 or 50 businesses. Most funds that you look at, you know, the median number of holdings of a typical fund is measured in, uh, in, in the thirties or forties. And that's just it, what's in, in people's, you know, listed 13 Fs. So who knows what the short portfolio looks like, international holdings, et cetera. So concentration to us is not just a point of differentiation that's secondary, but primarily it's um, sort of the only way that I think you can outperform and, and beat the indices over long periods of time. So that to me is, is probably, uh, I think the toughest thing about what we do and, and probably the thing over time that uh, distinguishes us the most. That, that, that's, that's, definitely, uh, that's definitely a differentiated strategy uh, relative to other funds in terms of uh, just focusing on 10 stocks, whereas um, a lot of other funds have a lot more holdings, but then they, they almost by definition replicate the market or replicate um, kind of like the, the index returns because the returns of an index are just driven by the, the 10, you know, the, the largest uh, stocks or the, the quintile of the largest stocks. Um, so well, they probably of, aren't even doing that well enough because if you just replicated the market returns, you would have done quite well. Well, yeah, right. Well, well, they do have to get paid as well. So, uh, so yeah. there, there is that fee element. Um, got it. So, so it's kind of that concept of, uh, if, uh, uh, I'm going to butcher the saying, but, uh, 
even if, if you keep your all your eggs in one basket, make sure that the basket is protected. And make sure that you're selecting the good eggs to uh, to put in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My my old boss, uh, and I don't know where the saying originally came from, but you know, he he was fond of saying, "I would rather put all my eggs in one basket and just watch that basket really carefully." And um, you know, I was speaking uh, about a year ago with with a with a manager who runs a, a call it a mega fund. And, you know, he had something like 200 line items in, in his portfolio. Um, and we've got 10. And he sort of looked at me and said, Benita, I don't know how you sleep at night uh, with, with, with 10 things. And, you know, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have the guts to say it, but in my mind, I was thinking, well, I don't know how you sleep at night with 200 things. Because, yeah, you're right. It's, it's, obviously more concentrated and therefore more volatile over a short period to own 10 things than 200. But, you know, when we wake up every single day or when I wake up or when I go to bed every single night, there's sort of 10 things that I care about. And you wake up the next day and the, the headlines of the market and, and, and the economy and the country and politics and all of that are extremely volatile, but, you know, you own 10 things. And as long as those 10 things are roughly in the same condition that they were yesterday, your portfolio is sort of in the same place that it was yesterday and you can sort of move on with the day. So it's, it's uh, you know, it reminds me of that old saying by Mark Twain or something, which is, uh, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. Right. And I think the same is true for portfolio construction. It's, it's way more difficult to cut names out than to put names in. Um, and, and so how do you think about versus the, the traditional advice uh, that you get uh, in fidelity commercials of you might you have to diversify uh, and diversifying is the key to uh, to kind of uh, getting a adequate return on the market over time so I um, I actually think it's very good advice for most people uh, I think you know Warren Buffett is fond of saying uh, uh, I love the s p index fund and I've told my the state after I die to put 90% of it in the S&P 500. I think that's very good advice for probably 95% of, of people. I think what we're talking about is uh, for people that choose to do investment management as a, as a career. You know, this is something I've chosen to do for eight, 10, 12 hours a day, five, seven days a week for six, last 16 years and probably the next 60 years. I think for, for those group of people, which is the minority probably of investors out there, uh, they could probably afford some focus and therefore some concentration. But yeah, I think, I think Fidelity index funds are probably uh, giving the right advice to, to most people. Um, but you know, in that, in, that, in that same commercial, they'll then uh, sell your brokerage account for, for no trading commissions and, and, and so, you know, the advice is sort of complicated and, and, and they've got different incentives. But no, I think, I think most people uh, should probably be in index funds um, unless you're going to make a sort of a professional career out of it and spend the time and energy and effort and, 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 and the necessary, you know, risk appetite, et cetera, that one needs. Uh, you probably shouldn't concentrate. So let's, uh, let's use that as a transition to talk about, um, you started your career um, in investment banking um, and you went from investment banking from Morgan Stanley to Duquesne, which is a tertiary macro fund, but has a, a very large equity group. Um, what was that transition like and, and what, is the, uh, what did you have to learn? And how did you have to rewire uh, your brain to think about investing going from banking to a hedge fund? It was, it was, uh, one of the hardest transitions ever. Um, and it was hard for a number of reasons. One is, you know, I'd never, uh, I didn't come from a family of investors. Um, I'd never bought a stock. You know, I had friends who were trading in their Fidelity accounts in their dorm room in college. Uh, you know, I wasn't one of those people. So the first time I ever looked at a stock, touched a stock, bought a stock was at Duquesne. And so, uh, it was, it was a difficult transition because it was new. It was a difficult transition, secondly, because, and I think this is where your, your question is primarily going, 
you know, as an analyst in, a, in an investment banking firm, you're, you're taught to go deep into the numbers and to, uh, you're, you're taught the importance of, of detail. Uh, you're taught the importance of, of precision. Um, you know, getting small numbers wrong is, is embarrassing. And if you do it enough times, it has an impact on your career. Uh, investing, you know, I think is, I, I, it's not the opposite of that. It's just very different. Um, you sort of get, the, the, the first thing you learn is how big decisions need to be made, made with imperfect information. Um, and so precision kind of gets thrown out the window right away. Uh, you start reading a lot more than banking. You know, banking, you weren't reading a lot. You were doing a lot. I think investing is the opposite. You're reading a lot and doing very little, hopefully. Uh, and, and the third big difference is in banking, um, you know, it's hard to compare and contrast these two things because they're not opposites or anything. It was just a transition that I and probably many others have had to deal with. But in, in banking, it was, it can be, to be a very good banker, you could potentially be somewhat insular, you know, you, uh, whereas I think over time to become a good investor, your network needs to grow and you need to talk to more and more people. There's things happening um, outside of your bailiwick. There are things happening outside of your country, outside of your sector, and you can't, uh, you know, you, you could choose to ignore them, but only after knowing what they are. Uh, and so building and, and, and growing and developing that network, that personal network, is a, a really critical part, I think, of becoming a good investor. And it's not, uh, you know, that was sort of a transition that I had to learn. That's, um, that's interesting, the, the network part and, and really like having a lot of information from different areas. Um, one thing I remember when, um, and full disclosure, I used to work at Techni Capital, uh, but one of the things that uh, you used to say that really resonated with me is when thinking about an investment idea, as a, as a hedge fund or, or um, as an investor, um, you really need to focus on the two or three things that matter uh, because there's just so much noise and so many things that you could focus on. And that takes a long time to really perfect in terms of like, hey, here's a company. What are the two or three things that we have to figure out with this company to really understand is it going to be a good investment or not? Whereas in banking, you have 1,000 line items and all those line items you have to sort of like do and get and, and figure out if they're working or not. Whereas uh, in investing, it's, it's, all, it's a lot more about prioritizing and thinking about the key themes uh, to focus on. Yeah, I, I will say one thing, Rob, which is that the really good bankers are, I think, not very different than the really good investors. You know, I think the, the, the really good bankers have a Rolodex, which is uh, uh, to be envious of. I think the really good bankers are able to quickly figure out uh, what a company's capital needs or, or M&A needs or strategic needs might be. Uh, and I think a really good banker is able to have a CEO level discussion with one of their client companies, just in probably the same way a really good investor could probably have a CEO level discussion with one of their investee companies. So, you know, I, I think the, the, the contrast that we were mostly talking about, you know, I was in Morgan Stanley a year out of college, right? So, Age 23, what's the difference between an investment banking analyst and a hedge fund analyst? Uh, but I think as you sort of get older and, and, and more experienced in, in either of those two businesses, the differences start uh, withering away and the similarities start growing. So, uh, um, so, so in, terms of, um, in terms of your tra transition going from uh, banking to hedge fund analyst and then from hedge fund analyst to PM, uh, to, to someone who's actually making the uh, investing decisions, but also building a portfolio and thinking about it more from a, a portfolio point of view. Wh what are kind of like the biggest lessons uh, that you learned uh, that you could share? You know, not, not all portfolios are meant the same. So I can only speak to the kind of portfolio we strive to build. The portfolio we strive to build is a concentrated one that's uncorrelated within. Uh, and when I say uncorrelated or at least low correlation, I'm talking about the, the revenues of the companies, not, you know, stocks are correlated uh, and, and certainly technology stocks are correlated. That's not what I'm talking about. So the biggest lesson that I had to sort of learn and, you know, all the important lessons take a long time to learn because uh, you go from sort of doubting it to, 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 to really believing in it. 
the, the single biggest lesson was that a portfolio, certainly our portfolio, is not our 10 best ideas. Instead, it's 10 ideas that work well together. And, you know, when you, um, and I, in, in, in my seat today, I'm, I'm sort of both a PM and an analyst. And when I put on my analyst hat and we're going deep into a company and talking to the, not just the management team, but the customers and the competitors and the suppliers and doing your, your diligence, uh, all, sometimes you'll realize that this is, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And I want to find more things like this. I want to find this in China. I want to buy that. I want to find this in Brazil. And uh, if you quickly make the jump to a PM, you would just have a portfolio full of 10 things that are basically the same. <laughs> and you know, over time, what will happen to you is you'll make mistakes. And it's OK to get one or two or three things wrong. It's not OK to have a portfolio go wrong. And so the single biggest you lesson you learn Again, if you're trying to build a concentrated portfolio, is to make it concentrated, but diversified. And um, that doesn't mean line items. It just means make the 10 businesses, you know, I think China is a wonderful place to be investing today. I, super bullish China. You, you know, we're not a China fund and we're not gonna become a China fund. Uh, we're super bullish data centers. Uh, we own one data center company. and. As a PM, you're sort of forced to find a really good idea as an analyst, put it down, and go find the, the second idea that has nothing or as little as possible to do with the first idea. The second lesson that, that I've had to learn as a PM um, is that it's okay if things aren't working, if some things aren't working. You know, I think a good portfolio, I say this a lot, is a good portfolio is one where some things are working and some things aren't. And that's okay because the next year it'll flip. And ironically, a bad portfolio is one where everything is working because odds are you haven't achieved the diversification that you maybe wanted to. As an analyst, it's really hard to have, uh, you know, all your Brazilian companies or, or American companies or European or Chinese companies not work. But as a PM, that's completely acceptable. Uh, it's not only normal, but it's often a desirable outcome because that means they'll come back. Uh, so it's, um, you know, I, I uh, every once in a while, we'll have one of our, our stocks uh, go through a rough patch. And if you own businesses over years, it's, you know, it, it, we own Facebook for, for many, many years. And probably every single year over that five or six year period, it went through a rough patch. And inevitably, you get questions around, hey, what's going on? And, um, and it's often from, from somebody that sort of doubted it or, or, or has reason to now doubt it. And you sort of, um, you do your best to explain why this issue is, is, is not a material one and it doesn't represent, uh, you know, impairment to the equity value and how basically they'll get through it. And I always remind the person on the other line who will often be a, a partner of ours that, look, I just want you to rem remember that we could be, uh, completely wrong on Facebook. You know, the stock could get cut in half from here and you could make money in tech because there's nine other things which we haven't talked about. And vice versa, we could be 100% right on our assessment of the future of Facebook. Facebook could double or triple from here and you could lose money in tech because there's nine other things. And it's that simple idea that um, you may be a look through investor of Facebook, but what you really own is the portfolio. You know, you own units in, in a trust. And that portfolio needs to work well together. Um, and that, you know, that, that uh, for me was a five year process uh, of sort of appreciating that a portfolio is not just your best ideas. Yeah, and, and uh, one of the things that we focused on when I was at Techni is not only diversification of businesses, it was also diversification of factors uh, because uh, to the extent that factor performance is in vogue one, one uh, quarter or one year and is in another, you want to have that balance uh, between growth, value, momentum, and all that other stuff. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, and then, uh, so one one other question, uh, kind of on the business before we get into some some stock ideas. Um, you know, you're uh, you've been able to kind of start your own fund after leaving Duquesne, um, and uh, you've run the, the fund for a number of years. Um, can you talk about kind of what it's been like to raise money, what it's like to 
uh, continue to have to um, raise money. I don't know if you're raising money now, but what is that aspect of, of running a hedge fund like in terms of dealing with investors and ra raising money from investors? Uh, it's, it's, it's full of surprises. Um, you know, I think in general, it's, this is year nine of, of Techni and therefore interacting with, with, with partners and clients. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I think in general, a lot of these clients get a bad reputation. Um, in my experience, they've been, um, uh, generally sympathetic and understanding and appreciative of, of your strategy. They're, they're generally willing to wait it out. They're generally willing to hear you out, but, uh, all of that patience and, and goodwill, uh, has to be earned. And what I have have learned in my experience of the last seven, eight, nine years of doing this in earnest is the clearer you can be in writing about uh, your investment strategy, uh, how you choose your companies, how you build a portfolio, examples, uh, mistakes, lessons learned. Uh, um, you know, the, the the clearer you can be along those lines and in a way uh, screen for the partners that would be appropriate for your strategy and therefore screen out those that wouldn't be appropriate, the better that experience is going to be of, of, of fundraising and, and dealing with partners during good times and bad times. And, you know, that's been um, like all lessons, a lesson learned with a lot of time and, 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 and maybe mistakes and pain, but, I would say over the last seven, eight, nine years, we've gotten clearer with communicating our, our strategy, what we do, what we don't do, uh, um, you know, how that's evolved and changed. Uh, what are some parts of a process that are still a work in progress versus parts of a process which are unlikely to change, right? I don't think concentration is something that uh, we're, we're, we're ever gonna let go of. Uh, our duration, I think, is something that should grow over time or holding periods. So I think the more you can communicate uh, or the more that I've been able to communicate in, in clearer terms, uh, again, in writing, uh, the, the better that relationship and that in general fundraising process has been for us. Got it. Interesting. Yeah, if, if, uh, if you can't say it in writing, then you're probably not thinking clearly about it. Uh, a lot of times. Cool. Good stuff. Um, let me, let's flip it over to the part of the, um, to the show where we talk about stocks. Let me share my screen. Okay. So um, you have a couple of, uh, of ideas that we're going to talk about. First thing I wanted to ask you is uh, tech stocks. So tech has had a monster run uh, looking, let's say at this uh, uh, 20, 10 year chart. Um, a lot of a lot of um, chatter, a lot of the talking heads on CNBC. Uh, they like to talk about a tech bob tech bubble. Uh, it's run too far, too fast. Uh, what what's your view on tech overall and where we stand today? So the the simple answer to that, Rob, is uh, I don't know if your system can do it, but if you can get tech earnings up against this thing, it will disprove any notion of a bubble immediately. Yeah, so, we, so we, we, uh, we don't have it on the ETF level, but I could, is, is Apple a good one to use or I could do it for a company? Uh, yeah, I mean, if we do, you know, let's do a few of them because whenever you pick a company, people will always, yeah. <laughs> people will always criticize that company. Which one do you want to pick? Let's just, let's just go through the five biggest ones in, in the NASDAQ. You know, so, let's. This is a good, so we'll do QQQ, HDS to look at the holdings. Uh, so do Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just create, um, you know, their 10 year charts and 10 year earnings, uh, LTM, NTM, whatever you want to do. And so Apple chart, and then, uh, let's do EPS. Uh, you want to do LTM or NTM? I, I you know, it, it, I don't think it'll matter. Let's do NTM. Sure. It should be a, a rolling. Will, th will this do rolling? Uh, th this will do a rolling uh, NTM. Let's actually, yep. Uh, you think LTM might be better for smoothing out any problems with projections? Um, yeah, so let's do EPS. Uh, 
Okay, so let's do that. And then we're gonna do, we said Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Facebook, Google. And let's use the, just those four over a, you know, a 10 year period. Okay, so we have the uh, 10 year period here. I'm just gonna close this. Uh, it looks like Google is giving us a little bit of a, um, uh, just the, the magnet, magnet yeah. just throwing off the yeah. other stuff. Yeah, let's kill Google. So let's just put this on a separate axis here. This is a good, there you go, okay. Or could we normalize all of them? Uh, you can't normalize the earnings yet, but that's a, that's, yeah. a, that's a good feature request. Um, so, so, t so, so Tom, and yep. let's, okay, so this is 10 years. So, I mean, let's, um, you know, Google's the one that's got its own axis, so it's easy to, to pick at this company. Uh, its earnings in 2010, um, $10 today are to 45 bucks. Yep. Uh, so that's, you know, four, four and a half fold yep. uh, growth in earnings. And, um, you know, its share price has gone from, let's say, 300 if it had just grown four and a half fold, it would be at $1,350. It's at $1,428 today. And there's probably a ton of cash on the balance sheet, which might explain the difference. Um, so basically the multiple, the trailing multiple isn't really, it's, it's, all been, it's, it's all been earnings driven. Yeah, these companies are not in a bubble. Exactly. These companies, uh, you know, a bubble to me is where the price is not justified by the fundamentals. Right. And th this, again, you know, we, we can go through all 100 of these or the other way to do it would just be to look at total tech earnings and tech earnings have really kept pace. And by the way, you know, a lot of people like to talk about the, the low interest rate environment. You know, Google hasn't, uh, there's no, there's no levered buybacks here, right? They haven't really benefited from the sort of low rate environment. So, so this is just the business has been booming, not for the last year or a few years due to COVID. It's been booming for ever since inception. And so, so how do you think about this? So right now, um, obviously you could look at this and say, wow, these, these growth rates have been phenomenal over the past 10 years, 4X, uh, let's say for the stock price and, and for the earnings, which is, uh, which is a lot in a 10 year period. Um, and, and so one can say, you know, the growth rate going forward might need to slow because the growth rate over the past 10 years has been strong. So how do you think about the prospective growth rate over the past 10 years for these companies, given how big they are uh, and how quickly they've grown over the past 10 years? So it, you know, that I think is, is the, is the million dollar question. Um, here's what I think. I think these mega tech companies, they're not even big anymore. They're just, you know, even mega is not the right word. I don't know how you describe $2 trillion businesses, um, the market share positions that these companies have in their respective markets, right? Apple and smartphones, Microsoft and, and software and the cloud, Google and Facebook and advertising. Uh, I think their market share positions respectively are unassailable. The, the leadership is unbelievably strong. The balance sheets are rock solid. And, and their trajectory, you know, their, their product trajectory and strategy over the next five or 10 years is also really good. They're all trying to diversify and, and they're all still investing in their core businesses, right? But I think you're right. When your starting point is a trillion or two trillion, you know, where can it really go? And therefore, in my opinion, these four stocks look more and more like bonds to me prospectively. In other words, you know, back when you think about bonds, uh, two things come to mind, or at least when I think about bonds, number one is reasonable assurance that you'll get your money back. You know, your principal will be returned. So low probability of an impairment of mm -hmm. capital. And secondly, you're not going to make a killing. You'll make um, maybe a mid single digit, maybe a high single digit percentage annual return. So if I had to make an assessment of the next 10 years, that's where I think these businesses will return. Uh, the stocks look more and more like bonds. That's very different than saying that they're shorts. It's also very different than saying that they're gonna do as well as they did over the last 10 years, but it's hard to, it's hard to paint a bear case. And by the way, as, as you know, as, as, as everyone knows, 
you know, generating 5% or 10% on a bond these days is actually pretty good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that would be a very attractive bond indeed. Um, so, so let's, let's, so, so the large companies, um, they're basically, uh, justified in their, in their stock price, given that the fundamentals have followed the stock price, um, yeah. d definitely easy to kind of, uh, think about it that way for, for the top stocks. So let's think about it. Apple, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, let's go to the stock, uh, called Tesla. So, um, if I think about, if I think about Tesla stock and, uh, I think about its market cap, uh, right at 369 billion. Um, I can make the argument that, you know, fine, Benita, get your point. The, the, the largest tech companies justified valuation, general earnings, but what about this guy? What about this $379 billion market cap that's generating, um, uh, revenue of let's see over here, uh, revenue of, of 30 billion, uh, for this year. So basically a car company that's trading on 10 times revenue. Right. So, so let's do the same exercise, Rob. Tesla has now been public for probably 10 years. Yep. Um, let's do LTM revenues if we can 10 years ago to today. So same chart, but, uh, you know, not all companies can generate EPS. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is 10 years. It had about a hundred million dollars of revenues. Is that right? Wow. Amazing. <laughs> is that, are you surprised it was that much or that little? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's very, <laughs> the point is, the punchline is, it's very different than their $25 billion, $26 billion LTM revenues they just generated. Right. So, so it's, it's clearly a company that's growing and it's growing quickly. And they obviously have introduced the product that people love. Um, I know you drive a Tesla and we recently talked about how much you love your Tesla. Um, but, but just, just thinking about kind of like where the valuation is today, um, yeah. of, uh, here, just to market cap here, like what's the, what's the upside for this company in your view? So, uh, a company that's like, how do I think about this as a, um, in three years time at a 500 billion valuation or at a trillion valuation, like what has to go right? Or what does this company have to execute on? I mean, so when we start talking about the future, you know, I think the right way to think about it is, uh, what is their market share today? Um, you know, I remember I was a shareholder of Apple um, at Duquesne uh, right before the iPhone came out. And I still, um, I'll never forget June of 2007, uh, that when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, um, he said, I think we're gonna sell 10 million iPhones. And there were about a billion phones sold back then. So he was targeting a 1% market share. Um, you know, of course, Apple now sells 300 million phones. So let's talk about Tesla. Tesla is going to sell about half a million cars this year. And the annual market is roughly 90 million. So their market share today is about half a point. So, and, so sorry, Gad. Uh, and... And there's, there's no doubt, certainly in anyone who's driven a car uh, made by this company, that it is the best car in its category, uh, you know, bar none. So, you know, the exercise one would have to do is how big is this market, the automobile market in five or 10 or 15 years? And what is its market share? What is its sort of deserved market share when they can ramp up production to, to a level where supply and demand can be matched. And that number you would have to believe is substantially higher than half a point. Um, you know, what, what's, what's really amazing is um, I was looking at another um, a battery company this morning and, and they have a partnership with Volkswagen and Volkswagen is targeting uh, in 2050 to be um, carbon neutral. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but maybe that means half of their cars will be EV by then. I mean, you know, Ford and GM have a similar target in the year 2030. Some of these other companies have a, uh, you know, they're going to hit a million units by 2025. So the lead the company has is unassailable. And the other, the other analogy to Apple, which, you know, uh, I, I fully appreciate it's sort of trite and a lot of people make it, but it is, it is the, the best analogy in, in two aspects. Number one, uh, 
you know, I, I don't know if you had the first iPhone, Rob. I had the first iPhone. Um, and I've, like many others, have had every iPhone since. And the first iPhone was far from perfect. I mean, it was full of little bugs, little things that even the BlackBerry and Nokia seemed to do correctly. Like, for example, email on that first iPhone just didn't work, didn't have 3G, et cetera. And I feel the same way about the Tesla today. It's just, you know, if you have had a, a Toyota or a Ford or a Mercedes or BMW or anybody else that's been making cars for decades, there's like little bugs and kinks and, and things you would do differently if you were Tesla. And just like uh, Apple, those problems that the first iPhone had created a 10-year a, a innovation cycle, and Apple kept getting better and better while everybody else kept going nowhere, and now here we are. I think that's the innovation cycle that Tesla's on for the next 10 years. So Rob, if, if um, you know, the right thing to look at would be the revenues of Ford GM, uh, you know, I don't know if BMW and Volkswagen have ADRs, but you know, this company does 25 billion in sales and uh, Ford is an entire company that does $130 billion and it's effectively one product, right? It's, it's, the, it's the truck, the, the, the Series F, and Tesla hasn't yet launched it. And, uh, and, and, and conspicuously, this number is starting to decline. Very right. Right. Um, and then, you know, you pull up a chart of GM, or rather just their revenues, right? If you just add their revenues uh, to, to that middle, that's another, so that's a $250 billion combined revenues. We're at 10% of that today. And that's just the two American companies, right? Then there's, you know, um, obviously the, the, not just the European companies, but the Japanese companies, right? Toyota, Nissan. Uh, so the point is, is this is, you know, other than housing, maybe the single biggest market out there. And, and we're just getting started. And how do you, how do you, um, how do you think about Tesla's technology, uh, technological competitive advantage versus, versus other um, car makers that are now getting into EV vehicles? So I think a big mistake that a lot of people made, and over time, um, you know, even as an early Apple shareholder, I made this mistake which is concluding too quickly that what's been done uh, is easy to do by somebody else. And what is underappreciated is uh, the business risks associated with a Nokia or a Blackberry making a hard right turn. And so I think tech, uh, Tesla does have a technology advantage and a lead. I think it's gonna be difficult to replicate it. You can sort of add up the cumulative R&D and CapEx that these guys have uh, spent over the last 10 years. And I don't know if there's a way to do like, um, I mean, you know, what, what, what's annual R&D um, and, and CapEx at, at, let's say Tesla. Um, and then, you know, you simply compare that number to what these other companies are doing. And I could tell you, 100% of Tesla's R&D is being spent in the right places. And I'll bet you Ford and GM are spending a lot of R&D trying to retrofit. They're trying to get to the halfway point, right? They're trying to launch a touch screen with the keyboard that slides out. Right. Um, so it's, so it's, it's kind of interesting that Ford has 130. So if you look at CapEx over revenue or, or the proportion, um, Ford has 130 billion versus 25 billion. Um, so, so, you know, that ratio, that's a much higher ratio than kind of like Ford versus, uh, Tesla and the, like Tesla per revenue spends much more on CapEx than Ford. Right. The problem is, um, you know, this CapEx is a five or 10 year return and GM is spending it all in the wrong places, right? That's still, this is why value investing is so tricky because GM, you know, that CapEx came out of revenues. So there, you know, it's like, it's like a newspaper company still putting up new printing machines. What do you mean? They, you're, they, you're not going to get that money back. They just launched a partnership with uh, Nicola. Nicola. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, Got it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, you might not get that money back. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So um, so awesome. So so that that's that's kind of the uh, articulation of the bull case for Tesla. I love it. 
Um, so t talk to me about some of the other companies um, that you wanted to discuss um, uh, in terms of ideas that you're thinking about. Sure. Should we talk about Agora? Let's talk about Agora, yeah. So Agora is, is, a, is a new, uh, reasonably new company to the public markets. It's a few months old. Uh, went public, I think, in June, earlier this summer. And what they do is they provide software in the form of an API, which you know, is, 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 is the future of software and therefore the future of technology. In fact, the company, I think quite cleverly, took their ticker to be API. Um, they provide a piece of software that allows for real-time communication between two people or two groups of, of, of people anywhere in the world. So let's say, Rob, you're designing a, a, a web app and you want to put in a, a feature there for two people to start chatting. You know, let's say you and I could have this discussion inside of koifin.com instead of having to set up a Zoom account. Now, uh, you've got two choices. You can either write all of that infrastructure for real-time communication, right? You're talking about people being able to call each other, video call, voice call, chat, one-to-one, -one, one to many many-to-many. -many. I mean, you're talking about building, you know, a, a a Facebook or a WhatsApp uh, type infrastructure. You're not going to do it. The other thing you could do is borrow four lines of code from Agora and anywhere where you've got white space on koifin.com, incorporate that feature. And with one click, I could connect to you and we could be having a video chat. This seems very, uh, this seems like a very uh, appropriate use case for what's going on right now. In terms of us chatting, it's very meta to chat, chat about Agora and what and the and the video that we could have here in the corner of Koifin chatting about Agora. Right. Um, so instead of instead of Zoom getting all this money from both of us, Koifin would be getting this money. Um, so I I think I I think the the bet you're making on Agora is is several. Number one, you know the the single biggest bet you're making here is the future importance of real-time communication and how prevalent is that going to become? Is that going to be a feature only found inside of communication apps like Facebook and Zoom? Or is it going to be a button that you find inside of everything? Are you going to go to uh, amazon.com tomorrow and click a button and ask a question to the seller or Etsy? Am I going to go on... Um, uh, Uber Eats tomorrow, click a button and ask a question directly to the restaurant owner, or am I going to do that on koifin.com? If you think so, then companies like Agora and Twilio, which is its American counterpart, will win. The second bet you're making is the bet on China. So software, uh, you know, the great thing about software is there's no real cost. Uh, the only cost software companies have, is, as, as you know, is people. And you've got two choices. You could either hire a bunch of really expensive people in Silicon Valley, um, you know, soft, good software engineers in, in, in California or, 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 or in Seattle, uh, now earn you know, seven figures, um, uh, which is what network engineers at Cisco were making 20, 30 years ago. Or you could go to China and write that same piece of code for, for a fraction of the cost. And the last bit is universal, which is you got to go over a telco network and telco costs are universal and they're going down over time. So, you know, th th this is one of those companies or businesses that to me seems like an inevitable winner. The, the stock here has kind of like traded sideways. If I, if I look at a company like Zoom, uh, that's, uh, that's been obviously like a rocket ship up to the right. If we add um, let me do this on the on the performance chart. If we do, if we have Tulio here, um, you know, kind of like looking at uh, even one year performance, like really strong. Why why has API been sort of uh, much weaker over the past uh, over the past year? Well, so so API's history is is a few months long. So so maybe Rob, um, we can start this relative chart the day of API's IPO. Yep. Um, and now what you see is it's, you know, 
Zoom just sort of is, is, is in a different category. Uh, and, and that's been the history of Zoom and probably its future. But Agora is flat and Twilio is roughly flat. The, the, the main reason is it, uh, a starting point on Agora as measured by, let's say, near-term valuation multiples was substantially higher than Twilio's. Um, so, Rob, is there a way to see, let's say, July 1, or I don't know what the, you know, NTM EV to sales for Twilio um, versus Agora? And then we can leave Zoom on here as well. So, so just... I'm, I'm going to have to go here, back here, and then uh, said EV to sales. NTM. Yeah, exactly. Let's do NTM. Exactly. Let's do it for these three companies. Uh, so for uh, Twilio... And we can kill the price chart or just... And then we can zoom and make this bigger. Okay. And let's start this. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is a good lesson for you on how to use Coifin, huh? Yeah, this is great. Uh, so the starting point, let's say on, um, I wish I could control your mouse, on July 15th or whatever yeah. the left most. Hold on. I'm going to give you my, I'm going to give you control, uh, give mouse control to Benit. Go ahead. Click to start. Wow, look at that. Um, see, Agora can't do this. <laughs> yeah. this. This is why it should be long zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on, on, you know, let me, okay, I won't try to get too fancy. On July 21st, um, Agora traded at 40 time sales forward and Twilio, its nearest peer, traded at 20, so half of its multiple. Right. And, you know, over the short term, things like that will impact a stock price's performance. And so Agora has had to settle in, uh, and Twilio sort of hung in there at, at that 20 times number over that time, but has gone up by about, it looked like the share price had gone up by, uh, you know, 10% or so. So I think, I think a big part of the, uh, the, the share price delta is just your starting point um, on valuation. And then, and then, last question on Agora: um, You have a lot of issues now uh, with uh, politics uh, bleeding into technology. Agora, obviously, a, you know, an API company, a data company based in China. How do you think about the risks that uh, that that it'll be prevented from from winning business or maybe even blocked in the U.S. Given that it's a, it's a Chinese company? I think, I think it's a risk, um, but you know, China is a big force, and uh, you know every um, force tends to have an equal and opposite reaction. So, I think if the world ends up in a place where Twilio is largely confined to America and its allies, and Agora ends up being the software platform for China and its allies. Um, you know, it's not a bad it's not a bad outcome, right? It basically means you split global GDP software real time communication spend in half. Uh, maybe it's two thirds, one thirds. It's uh, they're all good outcomes. So I think I think it's you know it's a little bit for, missing the forest for the trees by by focusing too much on on trade issues. When when a company's so underpenetrated and so small, remember this company's two months from an IPO. Uh, the, the micro decisions are going to matter a lot more than the macro decisions. And then do you think there's a risk with Zoom facing the same uh, political uh, restrictions? So they, they largely um, come out of that. Uh, you know, they did have those issues. Um, uh, they've, they've largely addressed a lot of those issues. They've rerouted traffic. Um, and I, I think they're sort of beyond that point um so yeah i think i think you've kind of seen what it looks like and 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 people have largely uh gotten through it you know one of the complaints people had on politicians had on zoom is that they had a lot of employees based in china well you know zoom competes with for example cisco and cisco has 10 times as many employees in china as zoom does so it was the kind of thing where uh they, they were committing a sin that everyone seemed to be committing right it was like lance armstrong and doping well you know are you going to take down the whole sport? Uh, and so as soon as it, it came clear that what they were doing was largely standard practice and technology, or at least in, in telecoms, 
uh, you know, a lot of the rhetoric died down and, and Zoom did a very good job of addressing it. And, and you're on the other side of all of those controversies. Got it. Interesting. Cool. Let's move on to the uh, next idea. Um, I think you wanted to uh, talk about Fastly. Or, uh, so, FSLY. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> not, yeah. not Fastly. Equally good chart. <laughs> uh, uh, Fastly. So tell me about this one. Yeah. So I think in a, in a way there, there's some similarities to what's happening uh, both at Zoom and, and also at Twilio and Agora which is this idea that network communication is, is obviously explosive. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's got no signs of ending or even abating, but uh, software is starting to play a bigger and bigger role, even in, in the telecoms space. And so what Fastly does <coughs> is uh, provide a service that, that, that they call edge computing. So historically, this has largely looked like the CDN market and um, you know, modern day infrastructure, which is what Fastly is trying to build is allowing developers to control all of the software and content on a global basis using just software. So there's no worrying about, uh, you know, which server should my content sit in uh, paying on a per server basis. You're simply focused on delivery. Um, and so what they are building is a, modern global network that's truly software based. And then you look at, um, you know, let's, let's, I'm just going to make an analogy to Zoom, Rob. You know, back in the day, if I wanted to call you, I had a phone number for you. And before that, I sort of had to know which exchange you were on. So those were largely hardwired ways of reaching you in the Zoom world. It's, it's a URL. Mm -hmm. And what Agora does is take that to maybe even the next level, which is I just need to click on you to be able to talk to you. You could be behind a Sprint network. You could be behind China Telecom. It doesn't matter whether you're wireline or wireless, but two buttons and we're talking. Agora will take care of the rest. Fastly does that for content, which is you want to access a website. All you care about is accessing, accessing that content quickly. Fastly takes care of making sure that content gets from you know, the, the origin to the destination as fast as possible. And, and how do you think about what Fastly is doing uh, versus uh, something uh, like a Cloudflare? So they're, they're both, a lot of similarities. Uh, they're, they're both going after what they call cloud uh, edge networking. Cloudflare is going after it using security. So what they're saying is, hey, every company has a problem of security. Come to us, we'll help you with the security problem and over time get you over to the edge. What Fastly is saying is every company has a problem with speed. Come to us, we'll help you with your speed problem and we'll get you over to the edge. So they're both driving at sort of the end vision being very, very similar, which is allowing companies to sit on a modern edge compute software network but one's using security to get you in. The other one is using um, uh, uh, speed um, and, and CDN to get you in. Got it. And then, so if we, if we think about kind of like the, the speed and the content for, uh, for Fastly, and we, let me get yeah. rid of this. Like one of the things that um, is a risk for investors, obviously, is that technology changes. So like a company like Akamai, uh, even though, it's, it's done very well recently, but kind of for four years, it was going sideways uh, because, um, you know, it, it was doing well and then it was kind of like trading sideways because some of the technologies and, and some of the uh, benefits that they would provide was being competed away and they were now competing with other, um, other technology companies that were providing a similar um, uh, uh, competitive, competitive offering. So how do, you, how, like, how do you think about a company like uh, Fastly that, provide something that is considered a uh, techno like a, uh, a leading technology and and how should how would you think about it in terms of being competed away by someone else like whether it's Akamai or Amazon or someone else someone else so I I think I think you're I think you're I think you're sort of right and 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 sort of not I think the bit you write about is that technology changes um, I think what Akamai got wrong was that they didn't change with the technology, right? So Microsoft is in the place it's in today 
not because their technology didn't change, but because they adapted, right? They, they, they had the software monopoly on the operating system. They converted that to an apps monopoly on with, with, with obviously Office. And then they converted that into, into this, let's call it a duopoly on the, on the cloud side. So, you know, Apple, same thing. It's, it's, they, they were a great computer company. Then they kind of converted that to a music player company. Remember the iPod and then to the phone and, you know, they're still innovating. So, you know, Amazon, I mean, all the great companies, what, what they've demonstrated, and I would exclude Google from this analogy because they sort of haven't, right? They still generate 90 plus percent of their business of revenues from the same thing that made them famous in 1999, which is search advertising. But Akamai's uh, vision, which is to make the internet a faster place, is still a relevant vision today. But the way you do that hasn't adapted. So I think the lesson there for me has always been to bet on the founder and the people that run fastly um, have, have done two things really well. Number one, these guys are technologists. Um, fastly, again. <laughs> Same chart though. <laughs> Similar chart, yeah. Just seeing uh, if you're paying attention. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, these guys are, these guys are, are technology people who you have to bet will keep adapting. Right now they're selling a CDN product, but they have a vision and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna get there. It reminds me of, um, of Roku, which is obviously in a, in a whole another part of technology, but to me just an unbelievable company and story, uh, not because the stick they made is so great, uh, or even better than the Amazon stick or, or the Google stick. But this guy that runs this company, Anthony Wood, he uh, keeps pivoting. He keeps adapting. He, his business today, Soroku, Rob, I don't know if you're, if, if the software, if Coifin does segment reporting. Um, we, don't, we don't have segments now. <laughs> if you look at what the business does today, um, their platform, the sticks are now a minority of the company's revenues. When it went public, it was the majority. And it's totally pivoted to advertising, TV advertising, connected TV advertising. Uh, so, you know, I don't think it's because they had the right vision. But I think it's because they had the right founder. So, you know, I think if, if Fastly succeeds in its vision, it'll be for the same reason that any of the other great tech companies have succeeded, which is the founders have figured out a way to keep adapting and, and shifting. Got it. Interesting. Uh, cool. Let's switch gears a little to um, to another part of tech. Um, you wanted to uh, talk about Taiwan Semiconductors. Yeah. Um, you know, so, let's pull up a let's pull up a yeah a, a, a mega long term chart and let's compare it against like you know Intel or or is this logarithmic? Okay, they'll all be logarithmic, so yeah. they'll be appropriate. No, can you baseline them? Uh, I just want to. I just want to show relative performance. Yep. And how? So, uh, so, so here's two things we could do. We could do uh, performance. So here we'll go under here, performance, and then uh, price change cumulative or total return. Doesn't matter. Let me take out Intel, and then we could do uh, we could do Taiwan relative to uh, Intel. And let's also, um, wow, let's also do relative to like MSCI or, you know, just MSCI World. I don't know. Do you have MSCI World or S&P? Let's do S&P, yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, so the point here is this is, <laughs> this is an amazing business. <laughs> yeah, all these charts look, look, look really similar. So t talk to me, like, it, it's obviously, it's, it's outperformed. Like what? What is there? Um, you know, uh, there's there's kind of a, this notion that that the semiconductor business is a commodity business. Uh, this would tell you otherwise because these returns aren't aren't cyclically like a commodity. And then the other thing is like what's going on over the past year uh, where the where where this is now accelerating, where the performance is like really accelerating, uh, both versus Intel and SPY. Yeah. So this is this is just the beginning. What's happening is. Um, over the last 20 years, 
this industry, you know, what, semi, what Taiwan Semiconductor does is they make chips on behalf of others. So you and I don't buy a Taiwan Semi chip. We buy an Apple iPhone with an Apple chip in it, but Taiwan Semi makes that chip for Apple. And making these chips is getting harder and harder. So if you were to take a look at Taiwan Semi's CapEx, so Rob, if we kill all these relative charts and we, or just hide them, and we just look at their annual CapEx over the last you know, 20 years, as long as possible, that number has just gone through the roof. Um, so this is a 20 year chart, this is perfect. So for the first 10 years from 2000 to 2010, it cost about a billion, $2 billion a year for Taiwan Semi to make chips on behalf of others. Over the last 10 years, that number has gone from a low of 1 billion to $20 billion a year to build a factory. This is annual. You've got to spend 20. And by the way, this is CapEx. So this is, can you do OpEx as well, Rob? Um, uh, so, so that would be, um, that would be in. Um, or can you do um, COGS? Uh, yeah, cost of goods sold. Um, and, yeah. and can you also do OpEx? I just want to. What, what, uh, remind me from my CFA, what's, what's OPEX, just total, just operating costs? Exactly. Uh, I don't think we, we aggregate OPEX here. Okay, so, so both of these numbers will, will, be, will be similar because your cost of goods sold is just depreciation of your CapEx. So we'll, we can just do the chart we used to be on, just the CapEx line. Mm -hmm. And basically, you, know, you ask what's happened over the, last, over the long term. What's happened over the long term is people can't afford $20 billion. So Taiwan Semi had a lot of competition 20 years ago because a billion dollars was affordable. Today, there is uh, two, two other companies that can afford this, Samsung and Intel. And here's what's happened over the last year. Intel has uh, more or less thrown in the towel because they're unable to keep up with the pace that Taiwan Semi is on. So this is the first year in history that Taiwan Semi has been able to generate a uh, manufacturer in scale, a smaller chip than Intel. Um, so Taiwan Semi is now at seven nanometers and Intel is still struggling at the 14 nanometer, 20 nanometer level. Wow. Um, and so Taiwan Semi has gone from a fragmented market to a three player market to basically a monopoly. Some people say it's a duopoly with Samsung. The problem is Samsung is not a clean competitor because they also on the other side, they sell a phone. So if you're Apple and you're going to make Samsung make chips for you, well, you got to be really comfortable that that, you know, that Chinese wall uh, is, is uh, impenetrable and that somebody on their phone business is not going to take a peek over the wall and see what your manufacturing chips look like uh, if you're Apple. And so Taiwan Semi is sort of this pure play that makes the thing that everyone in the world wants more and more of over time. I mean, um, and if we were to look at, Rob, I don't know if there's a way to look at like profit margins of this company over time. Mm -hmm. You want to look at EBITDA margins or net income margins? Uh, yeah, EBITDA margins is fine or, or even EBIT margins, any. Um, and we can get rid of CapEx. And let's do this. Oh, this is a 20 year chart. Wow. Um, I mean, you know, I don't know, Rob, is there a way to make the y-axis just zero to a hundred? I know it's sort of, yeah. And, and, and this, you know, this just shows the, the point better, which is for apparently a cyclical commoditized industry, this company has generated steady 60% margins. I mean, steady as a rock for 20 years. Right. Which, which are, which are, are definitely kind of like increasing. Yeah. Uh, and, and then lastly, Rob, let's look at their balance sheet. So um, I don't know if you can do net cash uh, or, or debt and cash separately. Um, but th this is sort of the last thing. Yeah. Total, total cash and total debt. Uh, uh, Yeah, total debt. And let's get rid of margins. So uh, the company today 
has got $20 billion, $21 billion of, of cash and about $10 billion of debt. That's a pretty healthy place to be. And it's been in a healthy place for uh, you know, a long time. Um, in other words, cash has almost always exceeded its debt. And, and so they're re-leveraging just to uh, take advantage of, of just low interest rates. Like they obviously don't need the debt because of the cash, but they're, why is that that level going up? Um, they, they keep investing, yeah. Um, they also pay a dividend. So I don't know if you can do dividend yield. So this is, uh, yeah, let's do dividend yield. Yeah, so the yields 2.2%. Uh, yields That's pretty good for a company generating 60%. Uh, margins growing quickly. Uh, monopoly. Monopoly. That's, yeah. that's a pretty good kicker with the 10 year at 70 bips. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, why was, was it considered, why was the yield so high for the past several years? Um, well, you know, rates were, <laughs> rates also weren't always zero. Um, I think, I think there was legitimate doubt about whether the company um, was as strong as it is. Uh, you know, Intel just basically threw in the towel in the last 12 months, right? You see the yield, Rob, just this year has gone from four to two. Right? Right. So a lot's happened this year to, to the price. By the way, de deservedly so. Um, uh, but the other big thing going on, so Rob, if you can chart growth rate, revenue growth rate, revenue growth rate for the company collapsed. And people got really worried that a couple of one-time things like the crypto mania, so NVIDIA is a big customer, uh, the, the smartphone boom, that, that those things were going to have a real big impact on this company. So let's get rid of the balance sheet at the top or, or just zoom in to this growth rate at the bottom. Um, and so, you know, in 2014, it's growth. Uh, oh, this is quarterly. Is there a way to do just to smooth it out a little bit, um, like an annual LTM growth rate or? So this is one year, uh, year but on year LTM. But it's each quarter. E uh, oh, yeah. no, no. Oh, oh, it is LTM. Yeah. So this is the year on year growth. Okay, I see, I see. Um, so, you know, look at what happened to the growth rate of the business um, from, from like 14 to 16, right? It, it went from 20% or more which is a big number to grow revenues for a semiconductor business to, to negative briefly. Right. And people sort of thought, you know, whenever that happens, it's the beginning of the end. And of course it hasn't been anything like that. If anything, it was, we're right back to growing again. And so people, because it's a semiconductor company, people constantly wanted to look like a semiconductor company. In other words, be extremely cyclical, but, but it doesn't, it hangs in there. It grows its market dominance. It's got a good balance sheet. It pays a dividend. It's got good margins, incredible leadership, um, and it keeps growing. How would you think about owning this company over the next five years versus Nvidia? Um, I think of this as a factory. I think of Nvidia as a founder-led technology company. You know, so so look at what Nvidia is doing. Right, they're going around and cementing their lead. They're buying Mellanox. Um, now they're in talks to buy ARM. Um, uh, uh, Mellanox is public, NVIDIA bought ARM, which is private or is trying to buy ARM. And both of those decisions are, are because you've got one person who's the largest shareholder and uh, is still the CEO. <coughs> think of, I, I think of Taiwan Semi as, um, as, as like a, you know, it's like a Nike almost, um, where you're, it doesn't really matter what the, what the semiconductor hot chip du jour is next year or five years from now, Taiwan Semi will be there. Mm -hmm. NVIDIA, um, you know, this guy better be making the right bets. Taiwan Semi, you're not really making any bets. In other words, what I'm saying is, I think there's room for both in the portfolio. Right. right? NVIDIA has made a very specific bet that AI uh, led by GPUs in concert with having, you know, a Mellanox and, and an ARM, th that is the future. Whereas Taiwan Semi is making a different bet, which is we don't really care what the future is. We'll build it for you. Right. And then, and then uh, thinking about it from a valuation basis. So NVIDIA, um, you're paying 50 times right. earnings. 
uh, 60, uh, this is, uh, this is trailing 65 times, but if we look at TSM, um, it, it, it's half the multiple. So much more, uh, yeah. just a, a much, much, uh, much better. Equally values. profitable, equally, equally profitable. Um, you know, one is a customer of the others, right? So one doesn't grow without the other. So the growth rates, um, they're both going to grow obviously at different paces, but really good balance sheet. Um, it's a clean story. There's no M&A. Um, Taiwan Semi is a bet that the big get bigger. NVIDIA is, is, is a bet that the smart, you know, the smartest guy in the room remains the smartest guy in the room. Right. Um, yeah. The, the, framing it like that. I just, I love the risk reward of, of Taiwan Semi then just at a lower valuation, still yep. get exposure to the growth industry. Um, that's awesome. All right. So moving on uh, to, to another uh, idea you wanted to talk about is XP. Yeah. So Brazil is an unbelievable place. What XP is, is, is um, it's one of the largest um, uh, investment management companies. So uh, think of it like a brokerage firm uh, in Brazil. And specifically the trend that they are writing is the uh, move away from bonds, which have largely been where a lot of Brazilians have kept their reserves into equities. So interest rates in Brazil, you know, Brazil is, is famous for its inflation, inflationary periods. Uh, yeah, let's, that's perfect. Um, so, so, so this is the, oh, well, this is going to be over the past, um, yeah, let's open up a new token tab and just look at the Brazilian, maybe. We'll go under fixed income here, under global yields, go to Brazil and, and just look at the, uh, look at the one year here. Right. Oh. So not even, you know, back when, uh, you know, your, your, your parents traded the stock market, but three years ago, uh, you know, around the time Donald Trump won the presidency, the Brazilian one year was at 16%. Today it's at two. Wow. You know, this is what the, the United States did from 1982 to two, 2010 or something. Right. Um, uh, Brazil in classic Brazilian fashion has, has done it in three years. <laughs> and and that's been true. I don't know, Rob, if we can graph the other, um, you know, the, the, the other parts of the curve, like the five year and the 10 years, if you go back to that fixed income chart. So this has been true, obviously, across the board at, at obviously different scales, right? So the, the five year, the 10 year, they've all uh, gone up a lot in, in, in price, gone down a lot, obviously, in rates, in yield terms. What that's done is it's forced a lot of people out of bonds. By the way, this is happening at a global scale, as we all know, but it's happening really acutely in Brazil and putting them into equities. Um, and XP, you know, think of them like the Charles Schwab of Brazil, stands in, in, a, in a really incredible place to benefit from that. And what's amazing about this company is profits. So Rob, is there a way for you to just charge its uh, chart? It's, yeah. We just look um, at, so revenue went from uh, 385 million to over a billion. And three, so it's quadruple profits in sort of three years. Or sorry, revenues in four revenues, years. Revenues, but, but also profits. So operating income has gone from, you know, 100 million to 400 million. Wow. Um, you know, this is while the currency, I don't know, Rob, if you can chart currencies on here, um, but the currency has gotten destroyed. Right. And to remind you, so this is dollar BRL, meaning when this is going up, the dollar is going up and BRL is going down. Right. So the currency is cut in half. You know, it's gone from three to six, more or less. Um, and in, in dollar terms, this is going up. So that's, right. that's pretty good. So the underlying business, you know, when you, when you look at accounts and how much uh, uh, those accounts are generating in terms of revenues and obviously therefore profits, it's an unbelievable trend. And here's the, here's the real punchline. 
which is their market share today is 1%. Uh, and they're, you know, larger than the next 10 largest real competitors combined. So they don't really have competition. They're riding the back of this enormous tailwind in, in the country, exceptionally profitable business model and reasonably priced and a long, long runway ahead. Awesome. So it sounds like some uh, really, really good long-term tailwinds for this, uh, for the stock. Yeah. Uh, cool. Awesome. Uh, well, wow. That was, that was a lot of information, a lot of good ideas. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, before we wrap up, uh, something that I ask my guests uh, in terms of everyone's locked down with COVID, watching a lot more Netflix and TV than uh, they used to with kind of uh, restrictions of, of going out and traveling. Uh, what's been your favorite TV uh, or movie, TV show or movie over the past uh, year that you wanna that you wanna share and pitch to people? Uh, well, uh, I I don't know if this fits the fits the last year, but uh, I think Succession, if everyone hasn't seen it, is one of the best things on TV. Have you seen it, Rob? I, I've seen a couple of episodes. Yeah. It's the, oh my goodness! This you gotta watch the whole thing. Yeah. You got to watch the whole thing like three times. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Every single character, the storyline, how close it is to the potentially the real life version of the story. <laughs> uh, I, it's, I mean, it's, and, and it's one of those shows. I think there's a lot of other shows like this, but this one really sticks out. There is a, it's not a comedy by any means, but there is so much humor in it. Uh, you know, you are cracking up at a lot of the scenes in the, in the show. So it's, 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 it's our, it's our family favorite. Cool. Awesome. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I think I'll pick it, I'll pick it back up. Uh, well, awesome. This has been uh, a lot of content, a lot of information. Really appreciate you sharing it with us um, and talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good, Rob.